Oh lord. You know what? I would still try it though. I'm not gonna lie. Like no matter how gross that is, aren't you curious what that tastes like? In this one frame, we have three of Ben's aliens, a Tetraman, a Pyronite, and a Galvanic Mechamorph. Pretty freaking sweet. Do they have to set that back up every time? All right, Subnaptak, he's done the book. Go strap it back to the ceiling. Must be Apu, the Mayan god of death and the underworld. They're just not gonna be faced by the fact they're gonna fight a god. Hey everyone, Kuro the Artist here, and welcome back to another Ben 10 Breakdown. Today, we'll be taking a look at a handful of episodes aimed to establish some world building in the classic series. While this version of the series had the least amount of lore in comparison to its four successors, it still makes efforts to play some pieces here and there to imply a much larger world of Ben 10 than we've dealt with before. Space battles, underground invasions, and Mayan temples. Let's dive back into the world of Ben 10 Classic and see what it has in store for us this week. If this is your first Ben 10 breakdown and you'd like to know how my wrap-ups and ratings work, you can read more details in the description and see a full playlist of all of my previous breakdowns. But by all means, stick around and watch this one first. I'm sure you'll still enjoy yourself. Let's get ready to jump right in, but first, a few quick updates. Let's start off with the results of last week's poll. In honor of our first alternate universe story, Gwen 10, I asked you guys that if Ben, Gwen, and Max all had the Omnitrix for the same amount of time and had the same training and experience, who do you think would come out as the most capable Omnitrix wielder? Out of the 22,000 votes, over half of them went to good old Grandpa Max, taking the lead at 57%. I've always been a defender that Ben is the true best choice, but when reading these comments, there's a lot of support for why Max would be the optimal choice. Although, consider this. If the Omnitrix always transforms the user into a species relative to their age, wouldn't all of Max's aliens be old men? The only transformation we saw him use was Upgrade, who, from what I can gather, doesn't really age. And while Max has shown to be pretty agile for a man his age, I'm still super curious about what these Max aliens may look like. I kind of feel like I could turn this into some community fan art thing. We'll see. Second and last update, not too much to talk about this week, I know. But tune into the Watchtower database this Sunday for our collaboration as we discuss the life and legacy of my true childhood hero. Dwayne McDuffie, who recently would have turned 59 had he not passed away 10 years ago. I hope the maestro is resting in peace. He is still missed to this day. Our first world building episode that we're gonna break down today features the return of Kevin, titled Grudge Match. This episode was written by new series regular Marty Eisenberg, which first premiered June 7th, 2006. We begin this episode shortly after Kevin, now in his permanent mutated form, is battling Ben, when they are quickly captured to fight for their lives on a galactic gladiator style broadcast hosted by showrunner Slix Vigma. After making allies with the fighters forced to battle for entertainment, they plan to escape the ship and return home. Starting right in the middle of the action here. So I guess Kevin just ambushed them. I like how we're already in the middle of a story. Gives it more time to dedicate to the later points. If they had to set all of this up first, then we would lose like half the episode. I've got all your powers, plus my own. I'm Kevin Eleven. His most famous quote. Too bad each one of those is only a tenth as powerful as mine. That's pretty cool. Diamond Head literally shattering a crystal made from his own DNA. Really shows off how much stronger Ben's aliens are compared to Kevin. What happened? <laughs> This is a pretty cool robot design. I wonder if this is a Perkins or a Johnson. These little arms coming out of the top kind of makes me think it's Johnson. This is the most amount of aliens we've seen at once. In an effort to make the crowd seem more active, there's a texture that's switching on the far away crowd. It's a pretty effective touch. And now we get to see Kevin's fight. And ever so briefly, we see even more fights going on into here. This lasts like maybe 15 frames. But you know, they got the crowd moving, they got the robots and the fighters being active. A lot of detail in the makings of this one. The classic series was always really good with its use of smear lines. Ooh. It's a good thing he was Diamond Head because he's pretty much the perfect choice to fight one of those. Like you for breakfast. 
Nice. It's little moments like these that make me appreciate all of the powers inside of Kevin. I'm pretty sure we see him use every ability, except for Upgrade, Ghost Freak, and Gray Matter. I guess it would have been neat if, like, Kevin became pretty hyper-intelligent having Gray Matter's DNA. I don't know how that would really change things or if it would work. At least one moment of every power used once would have been cool. <laughs> Oh, see, like that. Using Accelerate Speed, that was slick. And maybe Wild Mutt can give him, like, extrasensory abilities. Kevin is very used to having this body now. Look at him go. Oh, and every crowd member gets up. Look at all of these designs. They're all so colorful and unique. Yeah, that was pretty sick. This Tetramand, I'm pretty sure, shows up in Secret of the Omnitrix, but I only remembered the Mechamorph in Ben 10,000. There's a black and gray one right here. That's really cool. On oh, the crowds are moving. This is a really well animated episode. Everything looks pretty on model, too. It's drawn very well. See, they even got Ben moving right there and Kevin. They don't have to do that. There's even fire behind Kevin for this shot. Man, Kevin, you can't hurt a 10 year old. This is a sweet teleport effect. What they like decompose? I am loving this episode's visuals. They even got the effect right here. These things are really sweet looking. They remind me of the Robo Samurai from The Flash. And they've been tagged. Oh, you can see the earth in that shot. There it is. And right now they're passing by the moon. This moon looks pretty 3D. I don't know if this is a texture on a 3D object, or if this is a flat image that they're just applying a warp to. Like those animated League of Legends backgrounds, where it's just warping pictures to imply movement. Sorry I asked. There is even the reflection of the stars passing by through here, and the Earth is going at a different speed than the stars. No way off this ship and back home! This is a design we see brought up a lot in the next couple of series. Forced to fight for our lives for the entertainment of the galaxy. You hear those little boings in his voice? That's a neat touch. This is all your fault! And that's Kevin's response to everything. Meal time. Oh lord. You know what? I would still try it though. I'm not gonna lie. Like, no matter how gross that is, aren't you curious what that tastes like? Who's Technorg? Man, he looks awesome. He's like Vilgax level imposing. I forgot he had a straight up wrecking ball arm. That's a clear detail that I can't believe I forgot about. Is he also a cyborg? I don't wanna. <laughs> <laughs> Did he do that on purpose? Try picking on someone your own size. Thank god that worked. Imagine if he got, like, Stinkfly. He'd be fucked. Look at this coming out of the shadows effect. That's traditionally animated. I'm not saying, like, traditional effects are always better than digital, but it definitely requires the will to want to put that effort in. And this episode is full of effort. This is the Mega Cruiser. Everything on this ship belongs to me. Imagine having a ship called the Mega Cruiser. Like, that sounds like something Ben would name his ship, but this guy is like, nah, they're all gonna fight in the Mega Cruiser. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's that upgrade again. I guess I just forgot about him. No! You took the words right out of my mouth, freakazoid! Man, they're on an alien ship. Can they just put all this shit aside? Wow, there's a little glow effect for Heat Blast's arm. God, Kevin's probably gotta be really annoying to animate. I feel bad for whoever had to handle him. They're doing an excellent job, though. One champion here. Of course it's him. Bradley Uppercrust III. Give it a rest, Kev. Oh, I just realized we're at the point where Forearms has his regular voice. Let's wrestle. You are going down. I was just attacked by a giant lake monster. You're all women. Look, I don't want to hurt you. You want to be king? Get ready to be crowd. Is there anything I'm not going to get blamed for today? This is both our problems. Man, one arm. Why'd that punch explode? It's pretty awesome, though. Does he have explosives in his wrecking ball? Oh, that's gonna hurt. Ow. Damn, Kevin. Just pick him up. Did that hurt? Yeah, probably. I'm surprised he didn't break his neck. Oh, that shouldn't have worked. Everyone in the Tennyson family has infinite strength. Man, I can't get over that they put all the effort into moving these characters. And they all move their own special way, too. Like, look at this guy. What the hell's going on with him? He's awesome. This goes back to my point in an earlier breakdown where Stinkfly's goo was once used to put out a fire. So, I don't know why this works. Accelerate speed plus forearm strength plus diamond head invulnerability equals one mean punch. 
That's pretty smart thinking, too. That's not even just, like, combining powers. Ben's considering, like, the durability factor. Ben's really smart with his aliens for being 10 years old. Pretty good continuity. You can still see the crevice that they made in the wall when they got knocked into it. And just for this brief, like, two-second sequence, you get to see another Pyronite. That's, like, a rare sighting. And it looks like there's another Detrovite up here. Could be, couldn't be, who knows? This thing is really cool. Look at his, like, squid arm. In this one frame, we have three of Ben's aliens, a Tetraman, a Pyronite, and a Galvanic Mechamorph. Pretty freaking sweet! And these two things, could they be Arborium Pelorotas? That'd be nuts. This guy right here just keeps showing up throughout the whole episode. Did Kevin just flex with a Petra Sapien arm? Finish him off! Now kill that man. Again, how can he do that? Mercy? What a novel concept. This guy's got a lot of honor. Then spared my life. Now you are my master. Master? Whoa, that's a jump. I don't want to be your master. I just want to get back to Earth. They fried off? Aw, oh, yeah. A monkey could have done what you did. Then why didn't you? Roasted. Wow, so they're gonna... Oh. Whoa. Look at these things. They're like a Havoc Beast fused with a Vulpamaster. Yeah, murder! I got mad. This was a decent twist. Like, I'll admit, when I first saw this, I didn't think Slicks was a robot. It's not, like, super shocking, but it's... It was a pretty good reveal. Add some suspense. Wait! And this was a very smart way to handle it, too. Wait, the control console. And now I control everything on this ship! We must get to the escape pods before we blast off to the next galaxy. No. My life belongs to you. Wouldn't it have been cool if Technor came back to Earth with Ben and then he just stayed for the rest of the series? Uh, that would have been too much, but, you know, if, if, if they could have tried it for a few episodes and then he'd, like, find his own place on Earth. It'd be a pretty neat change-up, you know, this series doesn't have a lot of supporting characters. Nope, oh, Horace's dad is mad. I just wanted the pleasure of waxing you myself. The dial isn't rotating at all when Ben is moving his fingers on it. Ben's also missing his little hair tufts right here. Oh, I love this moment here. I don't think you've been introduced to Cannonball. I love that Cannonball is used here. Because it's like, at the time, the one power Kevin doesn't have. Uh, you can tell that Kevin and Cannonbolt were animated at separate times because sometimes the proportion of Cannonbolt doesn't line up to Kevin. Like, see right here? He's like the size of Kevin's fist. It's not like Kevin is supposed to be layered on top of Cannonbolt, because you can tell with the angle that Cannonbolt is coming at Kevin. It's just whoever was animating Cannonbolt and whoever was animating Kevin weren't exactly in sync. But, you know, this is happening way too fast for anyone to even really care about. Ooh, you know, right here, that looks pretty on purpose. Maybe they just didn't know how big Cannonbolt's supposed to be. Oh, nope, here he looks bigger. At this impact, yeah, that's closer to regular size. Is Cannonbolt just smaller in his first couple of appearances? Because he was pretty small in the big tick. My life belongs to you. Now get in there with him. Aw, oh, come on. Man. Were they just in this field for hours? Like, I don't blame them. If Ben just randomly got teleported away, of course you're gonna stick around and try to look, but it seemed like a lot of time went by when Ben and Kevin were in space. But here it looks like it was like instant. This was a pretty exciting episode. The plot, I'm going to give it a four. Not really in terms of originality, but with the story that it had, they did a pretty good job with it. This was Ben 10's first galactic adventure. The Slick's Vigma twist was nice, made things a little bit more interesting. I would have liked to see a little more demonstration of Slick's Vigma having control of the entire ship. It seemed like he basically just controlled the TV monitors and the robots and not much else. There was that flying cart thing that Ben used to save Technus, but like, if Slick's Vigma could control the entire ship, couldn't he just turn off the escape pods? Small things like that, I feel, stop it from being a full-on five. They're not really gigantic plot holes, they're just kind of little nitpicks. Like, how did Slicks even find Kevin and Ben in the first place? If he was just passing by on Earth, of all the people on Earth, of all the places, he manages to pick the two that actually have alien abilities. I like to think that maybe Slicks does, like, a life form scan of each planet and picks the best warriors based on his readings or something. But that's my own headcanon. Anyways, yeah, plot is a four. Pretty basic 
basic, but it was very streamlined and the nitpicks weren't enough to ruin the episode. Characterization, I'm going to give a five. Kevin was pretty much just a brat the entire time, but I mean, that's his character. It wasn't done in an annoying way, just in a you can really tell that Kevin hates Ben sort of way. Ben showed a lot of sides to his personality here, but strangely they didn't touch on the ego and pride side of Ben. Like Ben didn't seem to be enjoying the fact that a whole crowd was cheering for him at any point in the episode. Like you would typically believe him too. But I guess this shows that like when Ben feels seriously threatened or is in a dangerous situation, he does take things seriously. When Technorg offered to be his servant, Ben didn't even hesitate to say no. Also his overall compassion with Technorg in the episode was nice. And I just find Technorg as a very appealing side character. He wasn't super complex, but he had his own little arc in the story. And like I said, I wouldn't have mind to see more of him, have him come down to earth for a little bit and then leave at the end of the season. Yeah, it probably wouldn't have worked with all the future episodes, but I guess I'm just saying that he was a good character. They did a great job with him. Slick's Vigma too. He was a pretty great antagonist. I mean, he was evil, but he wasn't like, you know, over the top villainous evil. I like that classic gives you a lot of menacing villains. Visuals obviously gets a solid five. There was so much care and effort put into this episode that even in the small instances where some questionable things happened, mostly Cannibalt's size at the end. That's not even something you'd really think about when watching it, and everything else absolutely makes up for it. Like there was one shot where it just showed Grey Matter and Kevin, and they had to animate Kevin lifting his head from four different angles, and they actually went through and did it. Even Omniverse probably would have just used still images. There was a lot of love put into the little details and effects of this episode, and for the first episode that takes place in space, and where we really see a lot of aliens, it kind of needed that to pull this off. So they didn't slack on making the first galactic adventure a treat for the visuals. Importance, it will get a five. Not that the events of this episode are really all that important, but smaller details within it you definitely need to see, especially because the next time we see Kevin, he's still on that ship. And basically in the classic series, everything with Kevin is important. And also with Ben's first window into the galactic world, you know, that's something I'm sure you're not gonna wanna skip, especially with how rare it is in the classic series. And entertaining, I'm gonna give it a five. It was really cool to see Kevin combine his powers. It was awesome seeing all those different aliens. All the fights were done really well. The animation was was very colorful and very diverse, and I can't stress enough how those smaller effect details really help this episode visually. So we're gonna top this episode off with a 24 out of 25. I'm pretty sure this is the highest rated episode of season two so far. This is right around where I feel like the classic series really finds its groove, so I like that we're really getting to play in the outer space realm of Ben 10, because everything's now been established and set up and we've been through the Vilgax arc. Now it's time to see where else the show can go. And with that being said, let's check out the next breakdown. On June 13th, 2006, Joe Kelly's episode, The Galactic Enforcers, had aired. 66 returns as he is now teamed up with Volcanus as they head to Earth with plans to combine Element X with Earth's Iron Ore to create an explosive weapon. Hot on their trails is the space superhero team, The Galactic Enforcers, who team up with Ben to try to take down these villains and put an end to their schemes. <laughs> See, last episode was our first time really seeing the world that exists outside of Earth. And now this episode is starting off as if it's just another thing, which is cool. We're moving on. I love these robots designs. In fact, these designs is where I got the inspiration for 5YL Atomics. You'd see it in the arms. Now, when I first saw this as a kid, I thought this was still Technorg. And I was like super confused on why he's evil now. It's no good by itself, you know. You need sugar, spice, and everything nice. I always thought it was crazy how Ben still wanted to imagine himself as a superhero. Because, you know, he has the Omnitrix. Isn't that good enough for you, dude? Oh, I really love how the spikes are big. I always like when they draw Ben with big spikes. Although you really only get it in here and... What was it? Game over? Yeah, when he was a samurai dude. Ben! That's a work of art, you know. Ben's a weeb. You're going to get us kicked out of the museum. Hey, can I have a piece of that? Chocolates for superheroes only. Man, come on. I just realized it's sort of shaped like 6-6's head. And of course they land exactly where Ben was. So I've been cutting this from like all of my breakdowns, but throughout the whole classic series, his eyebrows always switch colors from either black, the same color as his hair, or a shade darker than his hair. It's like pretty evident. Like you could spend a whole episode staring at Ben's eyebrows and they're always changing color. These pupils are drawn a little wonky too. I guess all the budget was spent on grudge match. Oh, that's a neat looking bomb. Oh, that's not a bomb. Why don't you always use that? No way! Rescue formation, Alpha 9! Sweet. 
I'm pretty sure that's where Ben learns how to do the sonic clap. Will you yield? Yield! Kick their butts before they try to pull something! He's right. We make a good team, don't we? Careful, Tiny. That's how you get cancelled. I really dig the red highlights in the hair. So, it is true the Omnitrix is in the possession of a child. So word's really getting out about the Omnitrix now. It went from being a rumor to being fact. Probably because in Grudge Match, the battles were always broadcasted, so it's no secret now. The Galactic Enforcers! Yay, they pose. I love how his cape is blowing and literally nothing else is. It's like some Naptak is doing that with his mind. He turns to him and he's like, all right, every time we pose, you gotta make sure that you move my cape. It's gonna look sweet. It's cool that this is a different teleport effect from the one in Grudge Match to show like all the different technologies from around the universe. Oh, uh, one of his little disc thingies is in colored green. I just realized their logo is supposed to be some sort of pillar holding a flame. I always thought it was just some space shit. Hired to steal Element X. I don't know why, but that reminds me of Ash. But why come to Earth? Whoa, I gotta zoom in on that. But why come to Earth? My goodness. He's like, I don't know who to ask this to, so I'm just gonna make sure I'm looking at all of you. The observers will scan every inch of the city and locate the perpetrators. That's useful. Oh, I'm sorry, but the galactic code is quite clear. Who's he following these codes for? Does he work for somebody or is it just them? <laughs> Do they have to set that back up every time? All right, Synaptac, he's done the book. Go strap it back to the ceiling. Did 6-6's Six backpack always shoot fire? Oh yeah, I guess it always did. I don't know why, it just looks strange to me right now. Looks like they're after iron ore. Is that the missing ingredient? We'd better get down there. Why didn't he answer him? Well, there's all kinds of things going on with his face here. Let's get you in uniform. I love how it's kind of big on him. And the glove goes over the Omnitrix, remember that. I'm pretty sure I had the Galactic Enforcer Ben figure at one point. And then, boom! The galaxy will be at our feet. That line delivery was pretty in line with how he is in Alien Force. I always felt like Alien Force Onward always hammed him up a bit, but we didn't really know him too well in the classic series anyway. Engage! What'd you do that for? And let the bad guys know we're here? What's your point? I mean, he's kind of right. They could handle the situation, whether they get him by surprise or not, but it makes you wonder how they operate on a daily basis. Finally going to become a Tetramand? Jeez, Tiny. Must get lonely on that ship. So I appreciate that he has to slide his glove off in order to get to the Omnitrix, but it's still over his yellow sleeve, so... Oh no, in this frame, it's on top of both. I do like how they went through the effort of putting Ben in his Galactic Enforcer's uniform just for this transformation. Did you ever wonder why his hair was slightly different in this transformation. I feel like maybe the storyboard artist was trying to imply his hair was going to be constantly flowing during this segment, but the animators just took that as draw his hair this shape. But this is the most effort I've seen put into an accelerate transformation so far. Like they still do that weird transformation. In fact, they stopped doing it and changed it to a ripple later on, but you at least see the lines split out of his head. And he is in his Galactic Enforcer's boots, but the screen isn't done fading from green yet before he starts transforming into accelerate. But the way that the feet transform is much better than the original transformation. There's like this cool lightning effect going on and there's more effort put into the morph and then there's this dotted pattern that dematerializes off of his feet. <laughs> This is another really good accelerate scene. This is probably up there with his scene in the Kraken, although his wheel bearings are treated like discs instead of spheres. I must protect you! Wow, all these aliens are giving themselves up for Ben lately. Six Six has all kinds of weapons in this episode. Later series, he just shoots lasers. I wish he kept up with that. We should be beamed right down into the pit. Should? <laughs> Max is like, live a little, Gwen. The animation on Accelerate is fantastic in this episode. Why didn't we stay in that nice, safe spaceship? Yeah, for real, what are they doing down here? There's that sound effect that appears once per episode. Only I can save Tiny. One side, I think. Smart thinking, Ben. Using people's egos against them. Eh, the layering's a bit unpolished and oh my god, Max. What is with you this episode? Do you think he's still a Limax? Forge of a steel mill? Are there any such facilities in this area? Hello, Pittsburgh? Steel How is he supposed to know that? This time we do it the Tennyson way. We're gonna go fuck him up. Making steel's like baking a cake. So she knows how to make a cake, but not a pie? Easy as pie. Anybody know how to make a pie? <laughs> What is he doing here? Is he rolling on the wall? That's really cool. So two quick things. One, Cannonbolt has some grain pattern on him as if he was intertwined with the background. And two, again, super small compared to 
Well, I guess so far it's consistent. I guess Cannon Bolt was just tinier in the first couple of episodes. Also, if he can survive twice the heat of Earth's re-entry, he probably would have survived this. His mouth could use some coloring in. That's some pretty good choreography. No, here he looks pretty regular sized, although the highlights on his eyes disappear. There's actually been quite a lot of stuff like that happening in this episode, but pointing all of it out would make this breakdown like 40 minutes. Whip it real good. All right, he's a good size here. But it's like every time he's gonna hit somebody, he shrinks. This one frame uses pure black shadows. It looks really cool, but this technique is not used in the episode again. It's the second Omnitrix. Whoa, what was that? Yeah, some of these he should be pulling out more often. It's like, I can do everything, but only once. Don't know if it's art. But I like it. Oh, well, that's a nice call back to the beginning. I didn't get that at first. I have found a new partner. We officially extend to you a full commission. I'm already part of a super team. Keep it in hopes that we meet again someday. And they never do. Future doesn't count. All right, so let's get right to it. The plot, I'm gonna give it a two. The plot isn't bad, but it is a little bit formulaic. Usually I'm still good with that and I can still give higher points as long as it's got some other benefits to make up for it. But despite this supposed to being a stereotypical superhero episode, it kind of falls too much into that category. Things linked together nicely. There were some good callbacks and threads throughout the episode. But while this episode did have a lot of great things to it, it. The story itself, I can't say is one of them. Characterization does deserve a four though. The characters were very in line with themselves. There were soft, simple arcs that each member of the Galactic Enforcers went through, and they were pretty satisfying to see them concluded. I mean, you see it coming, but it's nice that these supporting characters do have a little bit more depth to them instead of just serving for the plot. Unlike Volcanus and 66, I can't really say much to them, but there was a lot of characters in this episode, and I do think the Galactic Enforcers were handled very well. Visuals is gonna have to go down to a three. I didn't point out nearly as much as I noticed, but there was a lot of pretty dicey coloring and animation in this. I try not to fault things for that too much as long as it doesn't ruin the episode, but especially compared to an episode like Grudge Match, which we just saw, there's a clear drop in polish that I'm sure any average viewer can pick out three or four things that look a little bit, well, strange. The fight scenes did have some cool moments, but they did seem pretty passive. What I mean by that is there's no lasting conflict or resolution. They're kind of just fighting because the good guys and the bad guys are in the same area so it makes sense for them to fight but this was one of those episodes that when you're watching the fight scenes you feel like no matter what the outcome is it's not going to change the overall plot although i will say their powers were used pretty creatively at times between ultimos tiny and synaptic they did have a pretty good balance between the three of them as a team importance however this is going to drop down to a one there are defendable points like the galactic enforcers do show up in ben 10,000 and vengeance of vilgax but there's nothing you really need here to understand understand either of those appearances. In the future, you could just assume that Ben met them at some other time, and Ben never sees them in Alien Force. So this introductory episode for them is nice, but it's not needed. Same with Vulcanus. He's almost a completely different character in Alien Force. In fact, when he first showed up, I didn't even realize that Ben ever met him before, and that didn't really make anything confusing. It does serve to emphasize that Ben will always choose his family over others, but there's plenty of other episodes that serve that purpose too. I guess I'm just saying, like, it's a good episode, but you don't need to see it. And entertaining, I'm gonna give it a three. It's a very passable episode of Ben 10, but beyond that, it doesn't have much else going for it. That brings this episode to a 13 out of 25. I didn't expect to give it that low of a score. I still think of this episode very fondly. It's the fun superhero episode of Ben 10, but that's about it. Eisenberg's second episode in this batch of breakdowns first aired June 21st, 2006 as Camp Fear. When passing by a campground, the Tennyson family is dropped into the middle of a fungus invasion, and Ben Ben and Gwen's bickering is getting in the way of a successful mission. After Grandpa Max is captured, Gwen works with the remaining campers to fight off the invasion, while Ben goes to save Grandpa with an all-new alien transformation, Wild Vine. Let's see how this one works out. Sorry, but I already picked the cake, color-coordinated the balloons- Wow, this episode looks really polished. I swear, every time we see this shot, it looks different. Who plans our birthday party six months in advance? The first clue that Ben and Gwen's birthday is December 27th. You know, for the longest time, I don't think I owned a pair of socks that didn't have a hole in them. And if you don't stop arguing, neither of you will make it to 11. Y'all think he's joking, but remember what he did to Phil? Here, Ben, try this on your foot. He's just got that in his cup holder. They're coming! Take a fly to the rescue! 
Our first wrong transformation in quite a while. That was pretty good. See, look how small this kid is compared to Cannonbolt. This is the size he should be. Ugh, that is one scary look. Don't touch it. This episode has a lot of gradients everywhere. Mm, food's still warm. Looks like I always thought the spaghetti in this episode looked so good. Damn right. What? I'm hungry. You two can share. Will you let it go? Only if you do first. Never. Yeah, they're both at fault in this episode. Usually one is kind of right, but here they're just nonstop ragging on each other. We'll the never plus one. <laughs> Look at Grandpa. Grandpa's thinking about that null void projector right now. You can see the split between the two layers a little bit right here. I mean, this probably would have taken too much time to really polish, but it's a cool little animation thing to see. In fact, the light animation overall is really good in this episode. There's tons of shots like this. See how the circle morphs to the shape of everything around it? It's not just a flat circle on top of it passing over. That's how my cat looks at night. We're, We're twins. <laughs> Sorry, but I've only got two clean ones. That's okay. We'll share. Oh, that's so sweet. It's like reboot Ben and Gwen versus classic series Ben and Gwen. I'm loving these blues used to really set the midnight tone. Ben 10 backgrounds usually have a lot of reds and browns, so I like when they switch it up a bit. Don't go out there! They'll find you! You know this kid is voiced by the same actress who plays Rojo? Wow, well, there's fungus everywhere. Now that's a really cool change. Now there's all sorts of colors going on. There's some luminescent plants to give it some special lighting. Ah, Max is always getting kidnapped. This is kind of freaky. I loved the split mouth design for him. These are very cool creatures. Man, if this wasn't so terrifying, this would be such a beautiful place. It must be a, a dormant species that came alive when the camp dug in this new area. What an oddly specific guess. So I guess it's not alien then, unless they're just ancient aliens. Those are puffballs containing billions of mushroom spores. This kid really knows his fungus. I guess it's a good thing he's here. He's my grandpa too. We might share a bunch of stuff, Gwen, but we don't share this. Be careful. That's a nice moment between them. It definitely feels more personal after seeing them argue through this whole episode. No! Oh! Can't wait for them to magically survive this. Remember folks, you can't write a cave scene without making the main character choose between two different ways to go. I guess that's all it takes. I love seeing Accelerate's claws used like this. Can you reach your watch? See, this looks like it's reacting to the plant somehow. But the classic series was never actually fond of telling you how Ben gets new aliens. I like how you do see his symbol on the Omnitrix. I think this is the only one they do that with. And we get some green effects going up the arms instead of the typical red. Oh, I never noticed, but you see veins right here. The seeds coming out in a random fashion looks very visually appealing. There's so much detail put into this scene. I don't remember if they promoted this episode with you knowing he would be here, but if you didn't know anything about this episode, episode and getting wild vine just comes out of nowhere i do wish this final pose had as much polish as the other ones though it seemed like everything was good up until this final frame here the ends of his tendrils are pretty uneven and too thin and there's a lot of overlap with his lines the heck is that beats me and the first thing he does with him is something that he doesn't even do that often i think he's done stuff like this maybe two or three other times it's certainly not his dominative power though i've always liked this moment here where he forms thorns on the backs of his fingers <laughs> Imagine if he just sliced Grandpa in half, though. I communicate with all vegetation on a telepathic level. So maybe the Omnitrix forced him to turn into Wildvine so he can understand him and play into the Omnitrix has an AI theory. It was your idea in the first place. And here comes the realization. Stop it! It doesn't matter who started it. What matters is your family. Got it? Okay. Good. Because my grandpa taught me a thing or two about enforcing rules. <laughs> Who are you talking to? It's like we're connected or something. This thing is a beautiful design. That's an interesting way to help him figure out more of his powers. You know, all these mushrooms against them with this, I would have just kept running. But here comes that Tennyson strength. Look at it, she sends it flying. They repeat that scream for him like three times. Wildvine's definitely earning his spot amongst Ben's arsenal. Even if you destroy me, you can't. 
cannot possibly destroy the billions of my spores. You know, it's a really good thing that Ben is here because there's nobody around to stop that. <laughs> See, there it is again. Who said the foot powder kills all kinds of fungus, Grandpa? But how is he gonna be able to wear the same shoes every day? Also, that's gotta be some pretty potent stuff if one bottle can take out this whole mycelium. That's convenient. Still gotta stop those spores. Any brilliant ideas on how to let this stuff go? I like this parallel, cause the first time we see Gwen and Stinkfly, he's holding her with his arms and she's terrified, but now she's riding his back and smiling. Wild Vine's debut episode. We made it, folks. Ben now has 12 alien transformations. For this episode, we're gonna give the plot an average of a three. Pretty tropey, kind of like the last one, but I really liked how these ones were used. I think the twin characters was a good counterbalance between Ben and Gwen. I mean, it's very obvious what they're there for, but the parallel of the twins being very nice to each other and then slowly turning into Ben and Gwen, I think that's a nice play on it to get Gwen to realize that her and Ben are fighting way too much, which I'm going to touch on. On in a second. This is another episode that relies heavily on coincidences, like the fact that the Tennysons just so happen to be there at the right moment that Ben magically unlocks Wildvine. It's clear that they're supposed to be implied that it's something to do with a mycelium when the bands on the Omnitrix glow green, and while that is at least more information than we got about how Ben got cannonballed, it's still not really an answer. It feels like we're starting to build up on a grand reason how Ben gets his aliens, and we never get there. Perhaps you don't really need an answer, but it's still a frustrating suspicion. I felt like a lot of the side characters started getting in the way towards the back half of the episode. The scenes with the twins Gwen and Gilbert fighting off the mushrooms was actually longer than Ben using Wildvine for the first time. I would have liked to see a lot more of that. Oh, and another random thing. If killing the mycelium disables all of the mushroom spawns, but the mycelium threatens that even if he dies, he can't stop all of the spores, doesn't the mycelium need to be alive for those spores to work? So I guess he was just bluffing. Anyway, moving on. Characterization is going to get a three. This this episode feels like it's supposed to be an analysis on Ben and Gwen and their relationship between each other as cousins and trying to get along and be on the same page, but it's played up way too much in this episode. Even in episodes where they do bicker like this, it's not this consistent. They did have that small moment where Ben made it clear that despite their differences, Ben is the one with the Omnitrix, and Gwen took that seriously off the bat, and Gwen showed concern for Ben rather than just being annoyed that she doesn't have powers. But I feel like playing up their bickering in this episode just to have a lesson to solve the issue sort of defeats the purpose if it doesn't seem like they're like that normally anyways and especially because they continue to fight each other all the way till the end of the classic series this doesn't add that much of an effect visuals i do want to give it a four all of the alien scenes are done very well once we finally got to see the plants mutating the area everywhere all the different colors the mushroom army everything in the tunnels the glowing yellow particles that was all cool but every time we were brought back to the b side of the story with gwen and the other campers <laughs> I know what they were going for, but it just slowed down the pacing too much, and it wasn't nearly as visually interesting as the mycelium stuff, especially since Ben just got a new alien. The animation and art was done really well. Importance, that's what I struggle with. The only thing that's actually important about this episode is Ben gaining wild vine, but I feel like that's not enough to earn it a five. The lesson they learned doesn't stick, the mycelium never come back, and this is just another side stop for the Tennysons on their grand road trip. And because you never find out how Ben gets wild vine, it kind of makes his introduction not that vital, but being as he is only the second new alien Ben got, I think that's still something worth experiencing. So importance, I'm going to give it a two. If you want to see Wild Vine's debut, this is it. Other than that, there's nothing here for you. And entertaining, it's gonna get a three. The best parts about this episode are great, but there's too much in between that slows down the pacing. There's too much time spent on Ben and Gwen fighting, and we've kind of done the whole kidnapping Max thing, and Ben has to go search through a tunnel to find him. That leaves this episode at a 15 out of 25. We're starting to dip into some low numbers in season two, but we're still keeping things in double digits. Let's move on to the last breakdown. We end today's batch of episodes with Ultimate Weapon, first airing July 6, 2006 by Jeff Hare. Fun fact, Jeff Hare was actually one of the college professors of Michael Garcia, the creator of Phantom Hollow. The Forever Knights and the Tennysons race to a Mayan temple to steal the Sword of Ekchua, a magical sword with legends of world-ending power. But as Max has been searching for this sword for years, it starts to drive a wedge in his morality. Can he succeed in finding the sword while still looking out for his grandkids? Let's find out. Something's wrong.
<laughs> All right, so the sword of Ekchua is revealed to be a myth, right? So what's this thing? This is this is clearly real. Like, look at that. There's no there's no fake in that. That's not no hocus pocus. You guys remember when that mask was gonna be in Fusion Fall? Dun dun dun. dun. Again, so like what would have happened if Max didn't reveal his secret? Like imagine Ben and Gwen are just chilling here, sitting at the table, then all of a sudden a monitor pops down from the ceiling. No. Grandpa? It's the key to the most powerful and destructive weapon ever created. The Omnitrix? I do like how they brought back this holographic display though. That's a bit of consistency with um, secrets. The Mayan god of war. His sword was rumored to have leveled cities with just one swipe. So does Max believe in gods? Whoever controls the sword, controls the destiny of mankind. Wow, Max really believes this sword can change everything. Wait till he hears of Ascalon. You go alien and sneak in. Now can I count on you or not? What's up with Grandpa? He's so... Uh, intense. See, I like how Grandpa is being so out of character right now, but it's also acknowledged by Ben and Gwen, sort of adding some validity to Max's sudden serious tone. I probably would've used Ghost Freak to sneak in. Don't you think you were a little... Now you're just kids. I don't expect you to understand. Ooh. That's demeaning. I should have just gone cannon bolt and busted my way in. Always loved hearing his aliens say the names of the other aliens. And that's the kind of dog Ben has, right? At least in one timeline. It has to be in here. I'm on it. That's a nice moment for Grey Matter. Over 40 years of searching, and now, finally. All right, the talking to himself is a little bit out of character, though. Like, there's a difference between suddenly being serious and then suddenly having an entirely different speech pattern. Who left the Forever Knights without a castle. And there we go. Now they're called the Forever Knights. For those that didn't see the previous breakdown, they were called the organization in their debut. <laughs> they're just gonna let them run? You guys have laser swords. We don't have time to fool around, Ben. Get in. Oh, you know what? Is that reused animation from Secrets? All right, so the dashboard flipping is reused, but I can't tell if this is just recolored or if they really reanimated this. No, yeah, it looks, yeah, it's re, it's reused, just I guess they had to recolor it too. Although it doesn't glow like it did in Secrets. The shield on the Forever Knight's car looks pretty sick. And I like the detail of it so low it starts to scrape against the ground. Man, that's a complicated looking buzzsaw. Auto driver engaged. Man, he should always do that. Good thing it still fits. Been saving it for the right time. I mean, he could wear it whenever he wants, can't he? Oh, he must have thrown that pretty hard. Hope they have their passports. I'm loving all these things that the rust bucket can do. So is this magic? Because magic exists in this world. That wouldn't be out of place. Can't you go any faster? I'm not used to flying with passengers. I guess, but I mean, he was able to hold the weight of Vilgax. Look at that helicopter design. Is that based on something? I like the look of it. Ben, what are you doing? All right, he's clearly trying to help. Now Grandpa really is just kind of being mean. Where'd he get that? That's a big reach. Come on, use that infinite strength, Gwen. That was close. Almost lost the mask. See, now I feel like Max's blind determination for the sword is played up a little too much. Sort of like Ben and Gwen's bickering from the last episode. I don't think Max would ever be this far gone when lost in a mission. And while you could argue it's just to emphasize how dangerous Max sees the sword to be, he's definitely encountered bigger deals than something like this sword. And maybe you could say he learns his lesson in this episode, which is why he never gets this serious again. But a moment like this where Max prioritizes the Max over Ben after he nearly dies, that's playing it up a bit too far. Oh, they're gonna have have to draw all of this getting demolished. It's pretty good though, there's some solid animation here. I don't want to hear Max ever complain about his back again. This scene is really well done. Oh, the wrist thingy makes a return. The tensile strength of that rope's gotta be insane. This is it. See, it's moments like this where he seems almost possessed by the idea. That's just, that doesn't line up with Max for me. That's a really cool looking gun. Legend has it that the eternal pit of despair is bottomless. Sparta. <laughs> bottomless or not, this thing must have taken them forever to dig. And it's like decorated too. There's multiple textures here. We got some pillars, we got some stones. How'd the Mayans pull this off? <laughs> 
magnificent. I gotta admit, that's a really dope looking sword. I just noticed the snake head. I think Gwen needs a second to catch her breath. You two have to keep your eyes on the prize and remember what's important here. Do you? See, a moment like that, I feel like, justifies the story. Because, like, Max is clearly out of character. It's just too out of character. Must be Apuk, the Mayan god of death and the underworld. They're just not gonna be phased by the fact they're gonna fight a god. This thing has excellent motion and posing for it. Feels like some crazy creature. Look at how it just kind of crawls around like a spider. Everyone's got a variation of those. You have enough time to just grab it. In fact, you'd probably need it. What? He can do that? And he's just gonna let Ben fall down the hole? What? Where's this stuff coming from? I have got to get a suit like that. Oh, you will. Wow, he just beat up death. And now all three Tennysons use their infinite strength at once. Not even forearms could have done that. Kneel before me. Guess that's what happens when your ultimate weapon is 5,000 years old. Okay, so a pop-up episode once said that this was a myth and the sword was never real. I always thought like all this was real and the sword really was just old. I think that makes more sense because I mean, there's literally that beast right there. There was that magic serpent thing at the beginning. I don't know, this episode's pretty confusing with its logic. And everything just starts falling apart as temples do, as temples do. Enoch, get out of here. No, my prize. See, Enoch survives this. <laughs> Look at him, he literally shrugs like, well, he's fucked. <laughs> oh my god, Max. Yeah, I guess Max has just got a dark side to him. You don't cross Max Tennyson. And now he's back to normal. <laughs> oh man, what a wild episode. Can I just say, we haven't heard Ben say it's hero time all season. In fact, so far in the whole series, he's only said it four times. And three of them were really early on. So this episode is very fun. I feel like my ratings are gonna be a lot of highs versus lows. For example, the plot of this episode, I'm gonna give it a two. This is a very different kind of Ben 10 adventure. And while the adventure was pretty fun, it feels like not a lot is really happening at the same same time. You know, they gotta go to one area, then they gotta go to the next one, and then the next one. I guess you could say the episode's about a giant obstacle race of who will get to the sword first, Max or the Forever Knights. But the plot about Max taking this so seriously and choosing to prioritize the sword over Ben and Gwen, it comes out of nowhere and then is resolved just as fast. I feel like this whole episode would have been exactly the same without that weird characterization of Max. And speaking of weird characterizations, that's where this episode is going to also get it to. Ben and Gwen were perfectly in character, but there also wasn't a lot to do. This episode mostly focused on the adventure with the character beats coming second, and the character beats were basically just Max was a jerk and the kids feel bad about it. Rinse and repeat, and while I do like there's that one moment where Forearms tries to snap Max out of it, it seems like Max is already the kind of person he's supposed to learn to be in this episode. I feel like this adventure doesn't justify Max's sudden characterization shift. Maybe it should have been centered around something more personal. It just seems like the story that they're trying to tell with Max shouldn't have been done in this Mayan sword chase and adventure. Perhaps it should have been saved for a different episode where it can be done a lot cleaner and make more sense. Because having this baseless MacGuffin just thrown in that has no explanation and is definitely not something as threatening as they usually deal with, I don't know, I'm just not convinced Max would behave this way. Visuals is where this episode shines. It gets a solid five. The animation was on point and everything seemed very on model. There was a lot of great set design. The action was very well done. We got to see a lot of different things that the Rust Bucket can do along with Grandpa Max's plum suit gadgets. The Forever Knights were pretty interesting. I don't know, I was just very into this episode visually. Importance? I'm gonna have to give it a 1. I feel like this episode is very skippable. The only reason why it has a point is since the series finale has to deal with the Forever King, every episode that you watch with the Forever Knights gives it that much more of a familiarity and understanding when watching the finale. But there's really nothing here that actually changes any of the lore. And there's nothing that develops the Forever Knights either. They're just kind of the villains of this episode. They pretty much could have been anything. I mean, this could have been Jonah Menville again, trying to sell the sword to be rich. I almost gave it a zero, but because I rated the Forever Knights episode that they first appeared in as pretty low, you eventually gotta start seeing something with the Knights. But if this isn't one of them, it doesn't really matter. But entertaining, I will give this a four. It's a very exciting episode. There's a lot of action, a lot of cool things to look at, a lot of diversity with the gadgets. So that rounds this episode off to a 14 out of 25. It's a fun adventure, but it just 
doesn't really fit in with Ben 10. Nonetheless, I would give it a watch just for the visuals, and there used to be a Cartoon Network game based on it, so there's that. More breakdowns means it's time to build our roadmap. Grudge Match, while taking place in space, doesn't give us any significant locations, as the only location on Earth, the field, is unidentifiable. The Galactic Enforcers, however, gives us the clear location of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or as Gwen puts it, Steel Town, USA? Camp Fear is another we're unfortunately going to have to skip out on a location for. We know that Ultimate Weapon takes place in Mexico, the first location outside of the United States. We're halfway through Season 2, and this map is already looking pretty crazy. Subscribe so you don't miss out on next week's breakdown as we continue to track the Tennyson Trail. You know, for a group of episodes about world building, I thought I would have more things to say for this wrap-up. All of these episodes add a little bit more lore to Ben 10 Classic, but as is the nature of the Classic series, it's never too much. And it prefers to live in the ambiguity of speculation. Grudge Match and Enforcers brought us into space, and we saw many, many new beings and outer workings of the galaxy. Camp Fear showed us that there's still quite a few things right here on Earth that still have some mystery and discovering for them as well. We never actually find out if the mycelium was really an alien or just part of Ben 10's world. So if the mycelium is just part of Ben 10's Earth, what else is there? We meet those mutant wrestlers in the fourth season, and of course with magical beings like Hex and Charmcaster. And now the Forever Knights are officially established. The classic series makes efforts to show that it's not just set in a version of our real world, but with classic you're always left wondering how strange this world actually is. Every one of these episodes raises more questions, and some are good mystery, and some is bad mystery. A good mystery is the lore of the mycelium. How long has it been there? Is there more like it? Does it have have a chance of regrowing itself from scratch? Are there more myceliums on Earth? Or the Galactic Enforcers? Is it just them, or are they part of a larger team, and where does this Galactic Code come from? Things like that I feel like is great and fun to speculate. It doesn't really put a halt to the mystery of Ben 10, but gives you something to chew on after the episode. But things are left ambiguous just because there's no real answer, and they didn't want to come up with an answer. Like how did Slick's Vigma find Kevin and Ben? How did Ben actually unlock Wildvine? And how much of that Mayan Temple magic was real? These questions are never answered, it just makes these stories feel incomplete, like we're only getting half of what's really going on. Like I keep saying, there's strength to leaving some things up for the audience to interpret, but the classic series relies way too heavily on that. Sometimes it's nice to just get a solid answer every now and then, you know? As for the stories themselves, well, I do think they were pretty entertaining. They all boil down to being based on character conflict. In Grudge Match, Kevin had to get along with Ben. In the Galactic Enforcers, Subnaptak had to get along with Ben. In Camp Fear, Gwen had to get along with Ben. In Ultimate Weapon, Max had to get along with Ben. Alright, that last one was a stretch, but it's not really hard to see we're kind of getting fed the same story over and over again. Sometimes it's done really well, like Grudge Match. Other times, like Camp Fear and Ultimate Weapon, it just feels forced. I guess it would be fine if there was a bit more variety to the character conflict other than these two characters don't get along and shenanigans ensue. But hey, we still got a great handful of episodes here, some of them I really love, and I'm excited to bring break down the rest of the season. Alright, let's try something new with the polls. Instead of just asking what your favorite episode was and then everyone just votes for the Kevin episode, I want to ask you what your favorite villain from the episodes were this week. Who do you think was the best antagonist out of these episodes? Slick's Vigma, Six Six and Volcanus, The Mycelium, or The Forever Knights? You can vote for your choice starting tomorrow, so don't forget to come back and check out the Ink Tanks community tab. But until then, you can stay up to date with everything we do on our social medias and join the Discord for some fun community engagement. You can also join the Patreon for starting $1 a month for updates on all of our future projects such as 5YL and, and beyond. I'll see you guys next Friday, but I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend for now. And as always, keep it fizzy.